currently in the United States, there are about 1.3 million prostate biopsies performed annually. And most often it's due to an elevated blood PSA level. An individual comes to their doctor, they have a biopsy, and because of the elevated PSA, they are at risk of having cancer. Now, 75% of those biopsies are benign, there's no cancer. And the reason being is, is that the test itself is not specific for cancer. If you have inflammation or uh, infection or um, uh, trauma, you can have elevated uh, PSA. What we've identified is a cancer-specific uh, mutation that you only have if you have cancer. And so using that test, we can now improve on our ability to diagnose it. So one important and tangible uh, effect of the, of the test will be that there'll be fewer unnecessary biopsies needed. Prostate cancer is very different than let's say lung cancer or pancreatic cancer where once an individual is diagnosed with those cancers they usually need to be treated very rapidly, very aggressively and unfortunately in many instances uh, the time between the diagnosis and the actual uh, uh, clinical mortality is very short. In prostate cancer it's very different. Uh, the five-year survival for prostate cancer is a hundred percent meaning that most men who have diagnosed prostate cancer in the United States have local disease and it takes actually many years for them to have a progression regardless of what treatment they receive. Now that only tells part of the story because the other part of the story is that there are about 30,000 men that die each year from prostate cancer and for those cancers we're trying to identify them as early as possible and develop tests as well as therapies to try to target them. We're living right now in an era where the technology allows us to sequence the entire genome of an individual and we're able to do that multiple times. So we are allowed to look into areas with the resolution that we've never been able to do before. And that's incredibly exciting. It also creates a tremendous challenge because now we have a almost infinite number of questions that can be asked. Our lab has developed what's called biomarkers, and those are molecular tests that you can use to add information to what the clinician already has. So the typical type of information they might get is history, family history, and pathology. And what we do is we look into the genome and we perform sequencing of the genome to look for mutations that may indicate markers of aggressive disease. In the past 10 years since I've been working on biomarkers, we started out working at, on one gene at a time. So my lab would typically be looking at a gene and we'd have six or seven people focused on one gene and it would take a few years. Now we have uh, high throughput sequencers like the one behind me where we can sequence the entire genome in several weeks. And the technology is advancing so quickly that this time period is becoming shorter and shorter. And what this allows us to do is now we can scan the entire genome and ask where are the mutations and then start asking questions, which ones are the key mutations that may lead to more aggressive disease. The challenge is that we have to now make sense of all this data. And so this requires us to interact with many other investigators and really it's become a team effort. So before an individual lab could be doing this and now we really have to work with a lot of collaborative partners to make sense of all the data that's coming out. At the end it's still a individual asking a scientific question but the types of data that we're getting require a whole team of computational experts as well as um, mathematicians, statisticians, and then our biologists. So that's, that's how the whole field has really changed a lot. We have investigators that are collaborating with us from across the world. So we have uh, teams in Austria, in Zurich, uh, 
uh, in the United States at the Broad Institute and University of Michigan. And this team approach is required because we often need large numbers of samples or rare samples, and it really requires us to canvas the entire world, basically. So that's, that's been our approach, and we haven't, you know, been concerned about any boundaries, whether they're institutional or geographic, in order to identify the samples that we need and also to identify people with expertise that we need. We're very shortly going to publish our seven whole genomes for prostates that were sequenced at the Broad Institute and here, and we're hoping that that data set will rec represent a unique data set for the research community.